A Tale of Two Cities by Charles Dickens. Book the Third, The Track of a Storm. Chapter Thirteen, Fifty Two. In the black prison of the conciergerie, the doomed of the day awaited their fate. They were in number as the weeks of the year. Fifty-two were to roll their afternoon on the life-tide of the city to the boundless, everlasting sea. Before their cells were quit of them, new occupants were appointed. Before their blood ran into the blood spilled yesterday, the blood that was to mingle with theirs to-morrow was already set apart. Two score and twelve were told off. From the farmer-general of seventy, whose riches could not buy his life, to the seamstress of twenty, whose poverty and obscurity could not save her. Physical diseases engendered in the vices and neglects of men will seize on victims of all degrees, and the frightful moral disorder, born of unspeakable suffering, intolerable oppression, and heartless indifference, smote equally without distinction. Charles Darnay, alone in a cell, had sustained himself with no flattering delusion since he came to it from the tribunal. In every line of the narrative he had heard, he had heard his condemnation. He had fully comprehended that no personal influence could possibly save him, that he was virtually sentenced by the millions, and that units could avail him nothing. Nevertheless, it was not easy, with the face of his beloved wife fresh before him, to compose his mind to what it must bear. His hold on life was strong, and it was very, very hard to loosen. By gradual efforts and degrees, unclosed a little here, it clenched the tighter there, and when he brought his strength to bear on that hand and it yielded, this was closed again. There was a hurry, too, in all his thoughts, a turbulent and heated working of his heart that contended against resignation. If for a moment he did feel resigned, then his wife and child who had to live after him seemed to protest and to make it a selfish thing. But all this was at first. Before long, the consideration that there was no disgrace in the fate he must meet, and that numbers went the same road wrongfully and trod it firmly every day, sprang up to stimulate him. Next followed the thought that much of the future peace of mind, enjoyable by the dear ones, depended on his quiet fortitude. So, by degrees, he calmed into the better state, when he could raise his thoughts much higher and draw comfort down. Before it had set in dark on the night of his condemnation, he had travelled thus far on his last way. Being allowed to purchase the means of writing and a light, he sat down to write until such time as the prison lamps should be extinguished. He wrote a long letter to Lucy, showing her that he had known nothing of her father's imprisonment until he had heard of it from herself, and that he had been as ignorant as she of his father's and uncle's responsibility for that misery until the paper had been read. He had already explained to her that his concealment from herself of the name he had relinquished was the one condition, fully intelligible now, that her father had attached to their betrothal and was the one promise he had still exacted on the morning of their marriage. He entreated her, for her father's sake, never to seek to know whether her father had become oblivious of the existence of the paper, or had had it recalled to him, for the moment or for good, by the story of the tower on that old Sunday under the dear old plane-tree in the garden. If he had preserved any definite remembrance of it, there could be no doubt that he had supposed it destroyed with the Bastille, when he had found no mention of it among the relics of prisoners which the populace had discovered there, and which had been described to all the world. He besought her, though he added that he knew it was needless, to console her father, by impressing him through every tender means she could think of, with the truth that he had done nothing for which he could justly reproach himself, but had uniformly forgotten himself for their joint sakes. 
next to her preservation of his own last grateful love and blessing and her overcoming of her sorrow to devote herself to their dear child he adjured her as they would meet in heaven to comfort her father to her father himself he wrote in the same strain, but he told her father that he expressly confided his wife and child to his care, and he told him this very strongly with the hope of rousing him from any despondency or dangerous retrospect towards which he foresaw he might be tending. To Mr. Lorry he commended them all, and explained his worldly affairs. That done, with many added sentences of grateful friendship and warm attachment, all was done. He never thought of Carton. His mind was so full of the others that he never once thought of him. He had time to finish these letters before the lights were put out. When he lay down on his straw bed, he thought he had done with this world. But it beckoned him back in his sleep, and showed itself in shining forms, free and happy, back in the old house in Soho, though it had nothing in it like the real house, unaccountably released and light of heart. He was with Lucy again, and she told him it was all a dream, and he had never gone away. A pause of forgetfulness, and then he had even suffered, and had come back to her, dead and at peace, and yet there was no difference in him. Another pause of oblivion, and he awoke in the sombre morning, unconscious where he was or what had happened, until it flashed upon his mind. This is the day of my death. Thus had he come through the hours to the day when the fifty-two heads were to fall, and now, while he was composed, and hoped that he could meet the end with quiet heroism, a new action began in his waking thoughts, which was very difficult to master. He had never seen the instrument that was to terminate his life, how high it was from the ground, how many steps it had, where he would be stood, how he would be touched, whether the touching hands would be dyed red, which way his face would be turned, whether he would be the first or might be the last, these and many similar questions, in no wise directed by his will, obtruded themselves over and over again, countless times. Neither were they connected with fear. He was conscious of no fear. Rather, they originated in a strange, besetting desire to know what to do when the time came, a desire gigantically disproportionate to the few swift moments to which it referred, a wondering that was more like the wondering of some other spirit within his than his own. The hours went on as he walked to and fro, and the clocks struck the numbers he would never hear again. Nine, gone forever. Ten, gone forever. Eleven, gone forever. Twelve, coming on to pass away. After a hard contest with that eccentric action of thought, which had last perplexed him, he had got the better of it. He walked up and down, softly repeating their names to himself. The worst of the strife was over. He could walk up and down free from distracting fancies, praying for himself and for them. Twelve, gone for ever. He had been apprised that the final hour was three, and he knew he would be summoned some time earlier, inasmuch as the tumbrils jolted heavily and slowly through the streets. Therefore he resolved to keep two before his mind as the hour, and so to strengthen himself in the interval that he might be able, after that time, to strengthen others. Walking regularly to and fro with his arms folded on his breast, a very different man from the prisoner who had walked to and fro at La Force, he heard one struck away from him, without surprise. The hour had measured like most other hours. Devoutly thankful to heaven for his recovered self-possession, he thought, There is but another now, and turned to walk again footsteps in the stone passage outside the door. He stopped. The key was put in the lock, and turned. Before the door was opened, or as it opened, a man said in a low voice in English, 
He has never seen me here. I have kept out of his way. Go you in alone. I wait near. Lose no time. The door was quickly opened and closed, and there stood before him, face to face, quiet, intent upon him, with the light of a smile on his features and a cautionary finger on his lip, Sidney Carton. There was something so bright and remarkable in his look that, for the first moment, the prisoner misdoubted him to be an apparition of his own imagining. But he spoke, and it was his voice. He took the prisoner's hand, and it was his real grasp. "'Of all the people upon earth you least expected to see me,' he said, "'I could not believe it to be you. I can scarcely believe it now. You are not—' The apprehension came suddenly into his mind. A prisoner? No. I am accidentally possessed of a power over one of the keepers here, and in virtue of it I stand before you. I come from her, your wife, dear Darnay. The prisoner wrung his hand. I bring you a request from her. What is it? A most earnest, pressing, and emphatic entreaty, addressed to you in the most pathetic tones of the voice, so dear to you that you well remember. The prisoner turned his face partly aside. You have no time to ask me why I bring it, or what it means. I have no time to tell you. You must comply with it. Take off those boots you wear, and draw on these of mine." There was a chair against the wall of the cell behind the prisoner. Carton, pressing forward, had already, with the speed of lightning, got him down into it and stood over him, barefoot. "'Draw on these boots of mine. Put your hands to them. Put your will to them. Quick!' "'Carton, there is no escaping from this place. It never can be done. You will only die with me. It is madness!' "'It would be madness if I asked you to escape. But do I?' When I ask you to pass out at that door, tell me it is madness and remain here. Change that cravat for this of mine, that coat for this of mine. While you do it, let me take this ribbon from your hair and shake out your hair like this of mine. With wonderful quickness and with a strength both of will and action that appeared quite supernatural, he forced all these changes upon him. The prisoner was like a young child in his hands. Carton, dear Carton, it is madness. It cannot be accomplished. It never can be done. It has been attempted and has always failed. I implore you not to add your death to the bitterness of mine. Do I ask you, dear Darnay, to pass the door? When I ask that, refuse. There are pen and ink and paper on this table. Is your hand steady enough to write? It was when you came in. Steady it again, and write what I shall dictate. Quick, friend, quick! Pressing his hand to his bewildered head, Darnay sat down at the table. Carton, with his right hand in his breast, stood close beside him. Write exactly as I speak. To whom do I address it? To no one. Carton still had his hand in his breast. Do I date it? No. The prisoner looked up at each question. Carton, standing over him with his hand in his breast, looked down. "'If you remember,' said Carton, dictating, "'the words that passed between us long ago, you will readily comprehend this when you see it. You do remember them, I know. It is not in your nature to forget them.' He was drawing his hand from his breast. The prisoner, chancing to look up in his hurried wonder as he wrote, the hand stopped, closing upon something. "'Have you written forget them?' Carton asked. "'I have. Is that a weapon in your hand? No, I am not armed. What is it in your hand? You shall know directly. Write on. There are but a few words more.' He dictated again. I am thankful that the time has come when I can prove them. That I do so is no subject for regret or grief. As he said these words with his eyes fixed on the writer, his hand slowly and softly moved down close to the writer's face. The pen dropped from Darnay's fingers on the table, and he looked about him vacantly. What vapour is that? he asked. Vapour? Something that crossed me? I'm conscious of nothing. There can be nothing here. Take up the pen and finish. Hurry, hurry. 
as if his memory were impaired or his faculties disordered the prisoner made an effort to rally his attention as he looked at carton with clouded eyes and with an altered manner of breathing carton his hand again in his breast looked steadily at him hurry hurry the prisoner bent over the paper once more if it had been otherwise carton's hand was again watchfully and softly stealing down i never should have used the longer opportunity if it had been otherwise the hand was at the prisoner's face i should but have had so much the more to answer for if it had been otherwise carton looked at the pen and saw it was trailing off into unintelligible signs carton's hand moved back to his breast no more the prisoner sprang up with a reproachful look but carton's hand was close and firm at his nostrils and carton's left arm caught him round the waist for a few seconds he faintly struggled with the man who had come to lay down his life for him but within a minute or so he was stretched insensible on the ground quickly but with hands as true to the purpose as his heart was carton dressed himself in the clothes the prisoner had laid aside combed back his hair and tied it with the ribbon the prisoner had worn then he softly called enter there come in and the spy presented himself you see said carton looking up as he kneeled on one knee beside the insensible figure putting the paper in the breast is your hazard very great mr carton the spy answered with a timid snap of his fingers my hazard is not that in the thick of business here if you are true to the whole of your bargain don't fear me i will be true to the death you must be mr carton if the tale of fifty-two is to be right being made right by you in that dress, I shall have no fear. Have no fear. I shall soon be out of the way of harming you, and the rest will soon be far from here, please God. Now, get assistance and take me to the coach. You, said the spy nervously, him man, with whom I have exchanged. You go out at the gate by which you brought me in? Of course. I was weak and faint when you brought me in, and I am fainter now you take me out. The parting interview has overpowered me. Such a thing has happened here often, and too often. Your life is in your own hands. Quick, call assistance. You swear not to betray me, said the trembling spy, as he paused for a last moment. Man, man, returned Carton, stamping his foot, have I sworn by no solemn vow already to go through with this, that you waste the precious moments now? Take him yourself to the courtyard you know of. Place him yourself in the carriage. Show him yourself to Mr. Lorry. Tell him yourself to give him no restorative but air, and to remember my words of last night and his promise of last night, and drive away. The spy withdrew, and Carton seated himself at the table, resting his forehead on his hands. The spy returned immediately with two men. "'How, then?' said one of them, contemplating the fallen figure. "'So afflicted to find that his friend has drawn a prize in the lottery of St. Guillotine?' "'A good patriot,' said the other, "'could hardly have been more afflicted if the aristocrat had drawn a blank.' They raised the unconscious figure, placed it on a litter they had brought to the door, and bent to carry it away. "'The time is short, Evremond,' said the spy in a warning voice. "'I know it well,' answered Carton. "'Be careful of my friend, I entreat you, and leave me.' "'Come then, my children,' said Barstad. "'Lift him, come away.' The door closed, and Carton was left alone straining his powers of listening to the utmost he listened for any sound that might denote suspicion or alarm there was none keys turned doors clashed footsteps passed along distant passages no cry was raised or hurry made that seemed unusual breathing more freely in a little while he sat down at the table and listened again until the clock struck two sounds that he was not afraid of for he divined their meaning then began to be audible several doors were opened in succession and finally his own a jailer with a list in his hand looked in merely saying follow me evremond 
and he followed into a large, dark room at a distance. It was a dark winter day, and what with the shadows within, and what with the shadows without, he could but dimly discern the others who were brought there to have their arms bound. Some were standing, some seated, some were lamenting and in restless motion, but these were few. The great majority were silent and still, looking fixedly at the ground. As he stood by the wall in a dim corner, while some of the fifty-two were brought in after him, one man stopped in passing, to embrace him, as having a knowledge of him. It thrilled him with a great dread of discovery. But the man went on. A very few moments after that, a young woman, with a slight girlish form, a sweet spare face, in which there was no vestige of colour, and large, widely opened, patient eyes, rose from the seat where he had observed her sitting, and came to speak to him. "'Citizen Evremond, she said, touching him with her cold hand, "'I am a poor little seamstress who is with you in La Force.' He murmured for answer, true, I forget what you were accused of. Plot, though the just heaven knows that I am innocent of any, is it likely? Who would think of plotting with a poor, little, weak creature like me? The forlorn smile with which she said it so touched him that tears started from his eyes. I am not afraid to die, citizen Evremond. But I have done nothing. I am not unwilling to die if the Republic, which is to do so much good to us poor, will profit by my death. But I do not know how that can be. Citizen Evremond, such a poor, weak little creature. As the last thing on earth that his heart was to warm and soften to, it warmed and softened to this pitiable girl. I heard you were released, Citizen Evremond. I hoped it was true. It was. But I was again taken and condemned. If I may ride with you, citizen Evremond, will you let me hold your hand? I am not afraid, but I am little and weak, and it will give me more courage. As the patient eyes were lifted to his face, he saw a sudden doubt in them, and then astonishment. He pressed the work-worn, hunger-worn young fingers, and touched his lips. Are you dying for him? she whispered, and his wife and child, hush, yes. Oh, you will let me hold your brave hand, stranger? Hush, yes, my poor sister, to the last. The same shadows that are falling on the prison are falling in that same hour of the early afternoon on the barrier with the crowd about it, when a coach going out of Paris drives up to be examined. "'Who goes here? Whom have we within? Papers!' The papers are handed out and read. "'Alexandre Manette, physician, French. Which is he?' This is he, this helpless, inarticulately murmuring, wandering old man, pointed out. "'Apparently the citizen doctor is not in his right mind. The revolution fever will have been too much for him.' "'Greatly too much for him. Ha! Many suffer with it. Lucy, his daughter, French, which is she? This is she. Apparently it must be Lucy, the wife of Evremond, is it not? It is. Ha! Evremond has an assignation elsewhere. Lucy, Lucy, her child, English, this is she? She and no other. Kiss me, child of Evremond. Now thou hast kissed a good Republican, something new in thy family. Remember it. Sidney Carton, advocate, English. Which is he? He lies here, in this corner of the carriage. He, too, is pointed out. Apparently the English advocate is in a swoon. It is hoped he will recover in the fresher air. It is represented that he is not in strong health, and has separated sadly from a friend who is under the displeasure of the Republic. Is that all? It's not a great deal that many are under the displeasure of the Republic and must look out at the little window. Jarvis Lorry, banker, English. Which is he? I am he, necessarily, being the last. 
It is Jarvis Lorry who has replied to all the previous questions. It is Jarvis Lorry who has alighted and stands with his hand on the coach door, replying to a group of officials. They leisurely walk round the carriage and leisurely mount the box to look at what little luggage it carries on the roof. The country people hanging about press nearer to the coach doors and greedily stare in. A little child, carried by its mother, has its short arm held out for it, that it may touch the wife of an aristocrat who has gone to the guillotine. "'Behold your papers, Jarvis Lorry, countersigned. "'One can depart, citizen. "'One can depart. Forward, my postilions. A good journey. "'I salute you, citizens.' and the first danger passed. These are again the words of Jarvis Lorry, as he clasps his hands and looks upward. There is terror in the carriage, there is weeping, there is the heavy breathing of the insensible traveller. "'Are we not going too slowly? Can they not be induced to go faster?' asked Lucy, clinging to the old man. "'It would seem like flight, my darling. I must not urge them too much. It would rouse suspicion. "'Look back, look back, and see if we are pursued. The road is clear, my dearest. So far we are not pursued.' Houses in twos and threes pass by us, solitary farms, ruinous buildings, dye-works, tanneries and the like, open country, avenues of leafless trees. The hard, uneven pavement is under us. The soft, deep mud is on either side. Sometimes we strike into the skirting mud to avoid the stones that clatter us and shake us. Sometimes we stick in ruts and sloughs there. The agony of our impatience is then so great that in our wild alarm and hurry we are forgetting out and running, hiding, doing anything but stopping. Out of the open country, in again among ruinous buildings, solitary farms, dye-works, tanneries and the like, cottages in twos and threes, avenues of leafless trees. Have these men deceived us and taken us back by another road? Is not this the same place twice over? Thank heaven, no, a village. Look back, look back, and see if we are pursued. Hush, the posting-house." Leisurely our four horses are taken out. Leisurely the coach stands in the little street, bereft of horses, and with no likelihood upon it of ever moving again. Leisurely the new horses come into visible existence, one by one. Leisurely the new postilions follow, sucking and plaiting the lashes of their whips. Leisurely the old postilions count their money, make wrong additions, and arrive at dissatisfaction results. All the time our overfraught hearts are beating at a rate that would far outstrip the fastest gallop of the fastest horses ever foaled. At length the new postilions are in their saddles and the old are left behind. We are through the village, up the hill and down the hill and on the low watery grounds. Suddenly the postilions exchange speech with animated gesticulation, and the horses are pulled up, almost on their haunches. We are pursued. Ho! Oh, within the carriage there! Speak then! What is it? asks Mr. Lorry, looking out at window. How many did they say? I do not understand you. At the last post, how many to the guillotine today? Fifty-two. I said so. A brave number. My fellow citizen here would have it forty-two. Ten more heads are worth having. The guillotine goes handsomely. I love it. Hi, forward. Whoop. The night comes on dark. He moves more. He is beginning to revive and to speak intelligibly. He thinks they are still together. He asks him by his name what he has in his hand. Oh, piteous kind heaven, and help us! Look out, look out, and see if we are pursued! The wind is rushing after us, and the clouds are flying after us, and the moon is plunging after us, and the whole wild night is in pursuit of us, but so far we are pursued by nothing else. End of Book 3, Chapter 13, Recording